Hey guys, this is Weston, AKA Wasu. We're in my lovely one bedroom apartment in Jersey City, New Jersey, just outside of Manhattan. Today, we're gonna walk through the track Krasbrutch, which is the last single of my Lost EP, out now on Silk Music. So before we dive into the project, I wanted to talk about a couple of studio essentials. You can see I have my KRK Rockets here. You see I have my MIDI keyboard. This is a very bedroom DJ-like setup. I would say most of my creative process really takes place here. And then once a week, I have a, I have a professional studio. This is kind of my home setup. And then once a week, I head to that studio. So typically, when it comes to, when it comes to the beginning of a song, right? So a lot of different producers have different ways in terms of you know, what they use, what they start with. Typically for me, the more producers that I talk to, I would say that almost all of them start with some sort of musical or melodic element. So for me personally, I usually start with like a chord progression. I'll literally just load in a grand piano, a stock grand piano from Logic and play some chords around to see if I can find some sort of inspiration. Other times, if I'm not, if that's, if that's not working, I'll either browse through Splice or Freesound or, or something like that just to see if there's some sort of sound or progression that's really, really captivating and sort of kickstarts the project. So I think for in this case, scrolling down to the bottom of my project here, you could see I have a couple of these ambiences down here. And I think the very first thing that I started with is this free sound used ambience. So something I just found, I think I just like literally online searched for pads, something ambient, and it just sounded interesting. And I just tuned it in the key of that I wanted to work in and used it and all i did is just some eq you'll see some chorus going on here as well you'll also see that i have some stereo spreading through ozone and the most prominent part of the beginning and outro of the song that really sort of carries the record from start to finish is this intro jazz soft keys element over here so just kind of moving along Basically what I did for this is I went through Splice, I found this audio sample that was actually really grabbing my attention, but I didn't want to use the full progression. And so what I did is I actually chopped out one bar of the sample itself, right? So it's just one sort of essentially drone note that's repeating throughout the, the entirety of the song. Processing, I added some unique chorus preset through effect rack up here. I also used some, some reverb through the hollow room, some echo boy to give it some more space. And then I EQ'd out a significant amount of low end, right? As you can kind of see through the spectrum analyzer here to make it a little bit more dreamy and a little bit more ambient. So that's kind of what I started the song with. And ultimately it was, it really sort of kickstarted the project for me and made me feel really inspired. So following that, that's kind of when I had some ideas in terms of what chord progression I wanted to use for the record. So, as you sort of see, as I move into the keys up here, you see that everything's kind of color coded here. Personally, for me, as I break down my color codes, I usually use like an aqua blue for my ambiences, right? My flutes and stuff like that. Vocal chops and stuff like that. I have pink, drums, I have blue and yellow, yellow for hi-hats and whatnot. Baseline is orange. And then typically for my main melodic elements, I like to just keep them green. So you'll hear sort of this ambient piano in the beginning of the song, right? Sounds like this. This is a really, really beautiful patch by, by Omnisphere here. So if I just pull up Omnisphere, it's the ambient space piano. It's just a really beautiful patch that I use pretty often in a lot of my songs. It's just very nice, warm, and, and deep. And so what I did in terms of coming up with the chord progression, if I duplicate this channel, I use this MIDI effects plugin that some of you may be familiar with. It's called Cthulhu by Steve Duda, X for Records. I use this, literally all it is, is it's a MIDI effects plugin, as I mentioned before. You could choose the key that you're working in. So in this case, we're gonna go ahead and use the C minor scale, which is what we're in, and just play one note. And it'll play different chords, right? So this is something that I use pretty religiously in all of my songs to sort of find chords that work together. And I just picked, I think, five or six chords that just really complemented each other, printed them to MIDI, and that's what I have up here. Processing, really simple, rolled off the low end, added some, some. I think I added a little bit of chorus up here as well. If I open up effect rack, actually, quite frankly, don't really know what I have going on. Some sort of tremolo delay. Again, a preset and effect rack. That's sort of how I think about 
creatively processing stuff, just kind of there's an unlimited amount of presets that you have here in Effect Rack, and you never know what you can stumble on to sort of something that could be interesting and unique. So that's what I used for the piano. And I also used a little bit of saturation as well. If I go into the, the ARP over here, the Omni ARP, this is something that's very prevalent in the record as well. So basically, again, another sort of Omnisphere patch that I used, a little bit of saturation through decap. Fab Filter Volcano is great. It's some sort of garage band preset that's essentially like a band pass to make it sort of pushes it more in the background. So if I, again, if I sort of just go back and I take off all the processing, it still sounds cool, but it just lacks that kind of lo-fi feel. So that's what the Fab Filter Volcano is doing. Again, Fab Filter, great sort of packs for saturation, gentle saturation, filtering, EQ as well. I use it pretty much in almost all my tracks alongside Sound Toys. Moving into the main breakdown, sort of, I guess the big payoff, if you will, you'll see, you'll sort of hear that there's a lot of new things introduced. And for me, I, I think it's really important to keep the song interesting. Everything, something's got to change every call it eight or 16 bars, right? And so it's very, I think Patrice Bomel says this in a Facebook post that he had about where he talks about arrangement. It's better to have, call it five and a half minutes of jam packed action versus seven minutes of just the same thing happening over and over again with little to no progression. So you'll hear in the breakdown, there's a lot of new melodic elements introduced here. There's this new guitar, the arp kind of comes back in here again. And then if we move forward, you can hear that strings are introduced. And these are all things that you're kind of hearing for the first time. And it's already been four minutes into the song. So moving along, to sort of the main elements, the musical elements of the breakdown, I have this guitar, again, literally just a vengeance sample that I pulled. But the processing is kind of what makes it very unique, as are the other melodic elements in the song. So for instance, you'll see that I have some Echo Boy, some EQ that's just rolling off the low end as we always do. And then I think the key, <coughs> excuse me, the key processing, that's really important here, is this kind of crystal choir preset that I have in Effect Rack. So if I just shut off all the processing, pretty dull, right? Um, but with adding Shimmer, the Shimmer Send, and some filtering, and some Echo Boy, and the Effect Rack preset that I showed you before, kind of makes it a little bit more interesting and unique. That sort of fits in well with the rest of the mix. Furthermore, the strings, Something introduced for the first time about three minutes and 45 seconds into the song. It's a VST that I use called East West. It's a really, really good cello, really good cello VST that I use in, in a lot of my songs. Just brings a lot more emotion into the, into the breakdown as we head into the main drop. Lastly, in terms of the main melodic elements into the, into the breakdown, into the drop, there's this vengeance pluck loop. Again, just a sample, really simple, but if I take off even just like the EQing, it's pretty harsh and pretty resonant. Yeah, like it's pretty, pretty like painful to listen to. So I think the EQing here is actually hugely important. So what I did is just through the stock spectrum analyzer here, I literally rolled off all the low end, I rolled off all the highs, I did an additional shelf. It's, it's quite bad, um, to be honest. And you'll see there's even some resonances up here as well. So I had to do a significant amount of gain reduction with a bell of about a point for a Q to sort of take out those, those harsh frequencies, but it's still prevalent enough in the mix that sort of, you hear it in the background, it really carries the progression of the song as we head into the main drop. And yeah, that, that's really it when it comes to the melodic elements of the song. So typically when it comes to, when it comes to building out a record, for me personally, I try to really get the foundation of all the melodic elements before I head into the drums, the bass, and the kick drum. So I think personally, if you if you really sort of start with the drums, you kind of limit yourself with what you can do melodically speaking. So I try to save that for, it's really kind of the last thing that I do prior to mixing, arrangement, and all that fun stuff. It's really the last thing that I'm incorporating into my song before I sort of build, build the song out. All right, so with that said, moving into the drums, I'm gonna go ahead and solo all of these. Lots of things going on here. I think ultimately at the end of the day, you'll see that there's this uh, there's this filtered kick, right? So that's sort of for the first call eight or so bars. 
you'll see that there's also a bunch of hats going on here. Soloing these one by one, I usually start with the kick drum. It's just a sample that I used in EXS. Shelved off some of the highs because it, it was a little bit too uh, too pitchy, a little bit too pluck heavy, I guess. So I just like did a little bit of shelf to put it in the pocket a bit more. The gain plug in the utility, just putting it in a mono basically. And then moving along to the clap, I usually have my kicks and claps in blue and then my hi-hats and other percussive elements in, in yellow, right? So moving along to the clap over here, you could see that it's literally a MIDI channel. Something that I've been doing recently over the past, call it year or so, is I will take samples from audio loops, right? I won't even like use a clap sample. If there's a loop that sounds like it has a nice little clap sample, I'll convert that to MIDI. I'll chop out the MIDI pieces that I don't want. In this case, again, literally an audio sample that we see over here, but I chopped out all the rest of the elements in that audio sample, and you'll see that I lined it up on two and four, and I just stole the clap from that audio sample. In addition to that, what I also did is I lowered the sustain. I lowered the decay to kind of make it nice and snappy. And the other thing that's hugely important with this, with this sort of processing chain is the max bass over here. So if I just turn this up a little bit, you can see that, you can hear that has this nice sort of warm body to it. So typically people use max bass for bass lines to kind of fatten them up, make them more warm, make them deeper. I use them on my claps usually, just to give them a little bit more body that a traditional EQ boost can't really do. So if I bypass it, It's just very thin. It doesn't really like punch through the mix that well, but if I have it on, it's kind of hard to hear, I guess, but it just really sort of gives it that much more color to the rest of, to the rest of the record from a, from a drum standpoint. Moving on to the hats, just have my basic hot hats over here. You'll hear there's the splice hats is kind of, again, really sort of the main hat that's driving, that's driving, driving the progression, the, the progression here. I have a little bit of an attack just to help it pierce through the mix more. And then I have some sort of ghost hats that are aligned down here as well. Moving on to the main drum loop, this is really sort of the main percussive element. Again, I, I do this always. I take an audio sample, convert it to MIDI, chop out the little bits and pieces that I don't want, maybe perhaps lower the, uh, the decay and sustain a little bit. Again, just kind of make it a little bit tighter. And what I did is I just added some Echo Boy and cut out the low end, right? So without the Echo Boy, just lacks that groove. So added some Echo Boy ping pong to kind of give it a little bit more groove and a little bit more swing, if you will. Next, the congas. So for Logic users, uh, if you don't know this, this is a very huge differentiator for Logic versus Ableton users. There's actually this drummer track feature that you can kind of see here, right? Where you could pick actually a certain type of drummer, be it a tech house electronic music drummer, a rock drummer. In this case, I, choose a, I chose a Latin drummer, Isabella. And then you can see all the different drum kits that you have over here. I chose the, the congos over here, right? Or the bongos. And ultimately this is a scale of how complex you want the groove to be and how loud or soft you want it to be. So I have it somewhere right in the middle. And then I just side chained it a little bit to, uh, to fit it in the mix more. And that's, that's really kind of it when it comes to, uh, when it comes to drums. And the last thing that I'll add about drums is again, progression is really key. So you'll find that on a lot of progressive house tracks, there is sort of like some sort of hi-hat loop that's introduced, call it after eight, 16 bars into the main drop. That's just something that a lot of producers do to sort of help carry the record. So in this case, I have this again, a converted, a MIDI converted, uh, audio sample. Again, it's just something that really sort of carries, carries the song going forward as we head into the, uh, the main breakdown. All right, so the next thing that I kind of want to talk to is uh, the vocal chops. So again, very simple, just a couple of few vocal chops that we have over here. Lots of stuff that I pulled from, from Splice specifically. I think it's, yeah, it looks like it's the Lanakia vocal sample pack that I used. Very simple processing, nothing crazy, just some, just some reverb and some, and some delay to make it a little bit more airy. And these are just little things, as we'll talk about next, is kind of ear candy, right? So I consider this a piece of ear candy that you can, it's prevalent, you hear it in the mix, but it's not something that you really sort of latch onto as opposed to like the ARP and, and the other things that you hear melodically speaking. But they're just nice sort of pieces of music that you sort of hear in the background that really sort of bring the song to life. So yeah, that's it. Reverb, Echo Boy, just to kind of fill out the space and make them a little bit more dreamy. 
Same with these flutes down here as well. They're kind of in parallel with the, uh, with the vocal samples that you can kind of hear. So that kind of nicely transitions into the next thing that I want to talk about, which is ear candy. So what separates records from uh, the records that sound like that they're made in their bedroom versus those that are made in a professional studio is the concept of ear candy. What that really is, is kind of little one shot effects, uh, sweeps, risers, stuff like that, that kind of really, you, you sort of hear, but you don't really notice it until you actually actively pay attention to it. But it's really sort of what, what sort of makes the song interesting so that when you're listening, it's, it's kind of captivating and keeps the song interesting from start to finish. One example, one great example of ear candy that I have in this song particularly is this little reverse low guitar pitch that I have heading into the drums when the drums are first introduced. Little things like that, just, just experiment, right? So I think to captivate something, to, especially for a producer's ear, like obviously, obviously you want something that's commercially accessible for the consumer listener, but I think ear candy is especially important if you're, if you're trying to cater towards other producers listening to your song where they might be listening and they're particularly paying attention to ear candy, right? Where they hear this, maybe this like reverse guitar low pitch channel that I have going on where they think, they think twice, they think, oh, what is that? Like, how did they achieve that sound? So just try and experiment, right? So for instance, I think in like Armin's masterclass, when he like adds like a piano one shot effects into this record that he's walking through, he adds like a crap ton of distortion through FabFilter Saturn. Very like non-conventional, right? Do non-conventional things to achieve crazier results that you wouldn't expect otherwise. So little things like that, I think can especially go a long way as we think about, as we think about going through, going through one shots and effects and whatnot. All right, last thing that I want to really kind of talk about is just other sort of ambience effects outside of the melodic ambiences that we already discussed. So this is a good opportunity for me to talk about this little guy. Um, this is a Zoom H4N recorder. I, I got it for Christmas, I think about two years or so ago. I use it religiously. What I basically have going on with this is this kind of change it up vocal that you'll hear in the beginning part of the song. So I'm going to go ahead and solo all of those elements. These four channels are literally from the same audio sample that I took in Croatia. You'll hear there's this change it up vocal that kind of ping pongs back and forth with an echo boy. Then you'll also hear that with limited processing, this is kind of the main the main picture element taking, taking sample that I took in Havar Croatia as well. And as we head into the main, the main sort of element, that sort of minimal drop at two minutes and 40 seconds, there's this kind of, as it's building, it's building, it's building. Change it up. Again, just something that you won't be able to find online. Something that I literally took with this guy. Just very simple, very great tool that you want, that you should probably be using if you want some proprietary samples or something that kind of sticks out and, uni and, is, uh, and is unique. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to, Feel free to DM me on Instagram or shoot me shoot me a note on Facebook. I'm I'm pretty responsive. I'll get back to you pretty quickly. Happy to help in any way that I can. Um, hope hopefully this is helpful and, and not too long. And hopefully you learned something new today. My if, if there's one thing that I would like to sort of leave you with, it's just keep it simple. Um, you know, just keep it really simple. Don't overthink things. I would just and enjoy the process. You know, you just never know when something can uh, can spark some sort of inspiration. I think this is one of the more one of the one of the simpler songs that I've done, but also one of the one of the more powerful ones. So uh, with that, I hope you guys have a good one and, and thanks for tuning in. Yeah.